Justice Ginsburg, thanks very much for taking the time to sit down with us today. You've been working on issues of women's rights, gender equality for your whole career. As you look back, what have you accomplished over the course of your career? I haven't accomplished anything alone, but I was fortunate to be part of a, a, of a revived feminist movement starting in the late 60s. And I was a lawyer with a talent that could contribute to that, to that effort. And what was accomplished? It was a stunning, stunningly successful effort in this sense. In the beginning of the 70s, it was what I call the closed door era. There were so many things that w women couldn't do. There was the familiar s stereotype that the woman was the center of home and family life, and the man was the representative of the family outside the home. The effect of that, well, it had many, many effects. One was that w women weren't called for jury duty. Now, you might think that was a pure favor to a woman because given the opportunity not to serve, probably most people uh, w would would de decline the invitation. But what it says to the woman is you really are not needed in our system of justice. We need the men, but women are expendable. So that effort to change all of the state laws that either exempted women they had, some of them had an opt-in system, some an opt-out system, but the arrangement said to women, you don't count as full citizens, because if you're a citizen, you have obligations as well as rights. And one of the prime obligations is to participate in the system of justice. So as part of raising women to full citizenship stature, an effort was made, a successful effort, to see that women were called for jury duty on the same basis as men. Then in the economic sphere, women were considered pin money earners, not the earner who counts. The ramifications of that, one was that if a woman must take a blue collar worker, she wants to get health insurance for her family at her plant. She is refused that coverage. She's told only a man can get family coverage. Women can cover themselves, but they can't cover their family. Or think of Social Security benefits. If a male wage earner retires or dies, his spouse could get benefits, he as well as his spouse. If a woman wage earner retired or died, her spouse got no benefits. So the effort was to treat people as people and to treat workers as workers, not male workers who are treated as the breadwinner who counts and female workers who are a lesser breed. Then occupations. There were so many that were off limits to women. Firefighting, policing. Think of how many women were on the bench at the start of the 70s, precious few. So the effort was to change all the laws that differentiated arbitrarily on the basis of gender so that women would have the opportunity to pursue their talents, whatever those talents might be, and to face no artificial barriers. So the law books 
in the States and the U.S. Code, what changed in the span of 10 years to eliminate the gender-based differentials that once cluttered them. So it was a very heady experience when I said that I was part of, of an effort to see that change happen. In the Turning Point case before this court, it was a case decided in 1971 called Reed v. Reed. I was representing uh, Sally Reed and the American Civil Liberties Union was supporting the case. On the cover page of the brief, we put the names of two women, one Dorothy Kenyon, the other Pauli Mary, because those women had been saying exactly the same thing we were saying in the 70s, but they were saying it in the 40s and the 50s, into the 60s, when society was not yet prepared to listen. In spite of the progress on women's rights that you mentioned, there's still a relatively small number of women in power, positions of power. Why, why is it taking so long? It's, the pace is slow, but it's moving in the right direction. I have a photograph in my chambers of Jimmy Carter, President Jimmy Carter, in 1980. In October of 1980, he had a reception for the women that he had appointed to the federal courts. He looked at the federal courts and, and thought, they resemble me, but they don't resemble all of the people of this great country. So he determined to put women on federal courts and members of minority groups in numbers, not just as one at a time curiosities. And no president has gone back to the way it once was. Uh, president Reagan was determined to put the first woman on this court and he made a nationwide search, came up with a brilliant choice in Sandra Day O'Connor. So uh, today women are on the courts, high courts in every state, and many of them have been chief judges of their courts. Justice O'Connor and I, every other year, would have a dinner for the women in the Senate. When we started out, there were six. And now, what are there? I think it's about 20. So the progress is slow, but it's definitely headed in the right direction. Um, what is the reason that it isn't more rapid? One factor that I think plays a large part is what I call unconscious bias. And my best example of that is the symphony orchestra. When I was growing up, you never saw a woman in a symphony orchestra except maybe playing the harp. Someone came up with a simple device. Let's drop a curtain between the people who are auditioning and the people who are making the selections. And with that simple device, literally overnight, symphony orchestras changed. People who swore that they could tell the difference between a woman's playing and a man's playing. Famous critic for the New York Times, Howard Taub Taubman, was, said, blindfold me and I can tell you if it's a woman playing the piano or a man. Well, they gave him the dropped curtain test and he failed miserably. He got all mixed up. So that was an example of there was no deliberate effort to keep out women but there was a certain mindset that a woman would not be as good as a man. It's unfortunate that we can't duplicate the... Would a woman president make a difference, especially in the context of unconscious bias? I think it would, but I have to add a caveat. And we have seen women heads of state 
in Israel, in India, and that doesn't necessarily mean that the rest of society will progress along the same lines. I think one thing that make a difference, probably if there is a woman president, she will have many women in positions of importance. And think, think of the change in law school. When I entered law school, I was one of nine women in the class of over 500. When I started teaching law school in 1963, women were less than 5% of the law students. And now they're, it's about 50-50 law school enrollment. So the more women that are out there doing things, the more other women will be encouraged to follow in their way. In terms of the court, um, given this court's um, alignment and views on some of the issues that are important to you, is it fair to say that you spend much of your time here fighting to preserve the gains that you've been talking about? For many years of my life, 17 years, I was a teacher. I was a law school teacher. And that's how I regard my role here uh, with my colleagues who haven't had the experience of growing up female and don't fully appreciate the arbitrary barriers that have been put in, in women's way. I mean, I was elated by the result in the Virginia Military Institute case, that there was only one dissent in that case, I think shows an increase in the level of understanding. Yes, there are still blind spots, but in time they will go. I was gonna say, speaking of blind spots, there's so many abortion restrictions being enacted across the country. Should American women be concerned that this court is going to let their fundamental right to have access to abortion services be taken away? Women should be concerned because abortion restrictions in practical effect target poor women and poor women only. Remember at the time of Roe v. Wade, 1973, Abortion law was in a state of flux all over the country. And in at least four states, during the first trimester, a woman could have an abortion if that was her choice. Many states will never go back to old ways. And what that means is no matter how restrictive a particular state law is, if the woman has the means to go to a neighboring state if she can buy a plane ticket or a bus ticket and afford the cost of the procedure. She's safe and she, she and her daughters will always have the choice. The people who don't have the choice are poor women and that frankly doesn't make any sense as national policy. So. Women were very much concerned about this question in the 70s. But now that it's safe for women of means, we don't see, I think, the, the same effort put forth to protect all women, to protect women who can't afford the procedure on their own. When you talked about educating your colleagues, I was reminded of uh, something you said about the Hobby Lobby case where you said, if there were nine women on the court, you think that case would have come out differently. What does that say about the rule of law in this country if a person's gender can make such a significant difference in how they view a legal issue? It means we are in the process of a social change and it hasn't gotten all the way, but as I said, it's moving in the right direction. Think of the racial discrimination that existed in this country not so long ago. Brown v. Board in 1954. It's an end to 
state-enforced segregation in our public schools. But it took another 13 years before we had Loving Against Virginia, before miscegenation laws were declared unconstitutional. It was inevitable that that would happen, I think. But it, it took a good number of years before the, the court was really willing to declare unconstitutional that last vestige of, of the days when people were held in human bondage. So I'm patient, and I think we've come a long way. We have a long way to go, but things are headed in the right direction. In Alabama this week, after this court refused to stay a lower court order um, allowing gay marriage in Alabama, uh, the Chief Justice of the Alabama Supreme Court told state officials that they should not comply. And as of right now, in some places in Alabama, uh, same-sex couples can get married and in other places can't. Are you concerned <clears throat> that if this court this year were to say that uh, there is a constitutional right for same-sex couples to marry, that there are parts of the country that would not be able to accept or would not accept that decision? I think it's doubtful that it wouldn't be accepted. The change in people's attitudes on that issue has been enormous. And I think for this reason, when I was young, people who were gay did not say who they were. They would disguise what they were. But in recent years, people have, have said, this is the way I am. And <clears throat> others looked around, and we discovered it's our next door neighbor, we're very fond of them. Or it's our child's best friend, or even our child. I think that as more and more people came out and said, this is who I am, and the rest of us rec recognized that they, they are one of us. That there, there was a familiarity with people that didn't exist in the beginning when the race problem was uh, on the front burner because we lived in segregated communities and it was truly a we-they kind of thing. It's not so, I think, of the, the gay rights movement. So many people recognized their own biases when they saw it was somebody they cared for, that they respected. So I think it, it, would, not take, it would not take a large adjustment. And of course, we shouldn't speak much more about this subject because one way or another, it will be decided before we leave town in June. You have developed quite a, a following um, among young people and, and young women in, in particular. Um, you have the notorious uh, RBG uh, Tumblr. You have uh, babies dressed up as Ruth Baby Gin Ginsburg. And I'm wondering, what do you think it is about you that has captured the imagination of, of so many people? The notorious RBG was started by a student at NYU Law School. And when the Tumblr first appeared, I asked my law clerks, what is this all about that I didn't know about, Notorious B.I.G.? And then I discovered we had at least one thing in common, that we both grew up in Brooklyn. Uh, I think it's amusing. I think it's quite well done. There are some serious things uh, on it. There are some funny things um, among the things on the Notorious RBG are papers that were released by the Clinton Library that had to do with my, my nomination. And I have a, a supply of RBG, notorious RBG t-shirts that I give to law clerks for birthday presents and other people as well. The people who created notorious RBG came to court one day. This this term, and they sat in and, 
and watched the arguments and then came to my chambers and we had a, a nice conversation. These are people who find you inspirational. Do you think you're inspirational? I just try to do the good job that I have to the best of my ability and I really don't think about whether I'm inspirational. I just do the best I can. And right now you're not thinking at all about uh, retiring as some people have suggested you do, uh -huh. if only because it's not clear who's going to be elected in the next election, unless you, of course, think uh, it will be Hillary Clinton or some other Democrat. I think I should do this job as long as I can do it full steam. steam. And when I begin to slow down, I think I will know. Um, it hasn't happened yet. I'm no slower in producing opinions than I, I was my first year here. Can you tell us about your recent health scare uh, that sent you to the hospital to get a stent implanted? Yes. I meet with a personal trainer twice a week, and I've done that religiously since 1999. I had a bout with colorectal cancer, massive surgery, chemotherapy, daily radiation. The, the, by the end of this, I looked, my, my husband said, you look like a survivor of a concentration camp. You have to do something to build yourself up. So I started with my trainer in that year, and we've been meeting twice a week ever since. We were training one evening when suddenly I felt a terrible constriction in my in my chest and I broke out in a sweat and I was nauseous. So I said to the trainer, I better lie down for a while. He said, you should, we should call an ambulance and you should go to the hospital. I was stubborn and I said, this will pass. So my trainer called my secretary who had gone home for the evening. She came back and, and in her gently persuasive way, she got me into the ambulance and we went to Washington Hospital Center. It was a clogged right artery and it was an amazing procedure now. They, do, they insert this stent through your wrist and I was kind of groggy but I was awake the whole time and could see the monitor where the stent was being inserted. As soon as it was inserted, the constriction was gone. I was fine. I wanted to go home immediately, but, but the medical staff thought I should stay a couple of nights. Justice Ginsburg, you uh, and President Clinton have a clear fondness for each other, and that becomes clear every time we're at a State of the Union address. And President Obama. President Obama. I, I have a great fondness for President Clinton, Clinton who gave me this good job. Both of them. And I'd just like to know, with a President Obama, what is it especially that has made this relationship uh, as special as it is for you? It started when he was a new senator. I knew about him because I have a son who lives in Chicago who assisted in the campaign for then Senator Obama. Whenever there's a new Congress, we have a dinner at the court for all the members of the Senate. And I asked if I could be seated with the new senator from Illinois. And I was. Then that's when I, I met the Obamas for the first time. And we just got along famously, liked each other. Um, the president had taught at Chicago Law School. So we discussed constitutional law, and the, there was a r rapport from the from the the start between us. And what do you think at this point will be his legacy? I think it it, it remains to be seen. Um, but one of the many things he has done, our country was just about the only a Western industrialized country that had that didn't have universal health care for all of the people. And he made the first giant step 
in that direction. That's certainly one of the things he, he will be remembered for. Well, doesn't that depend on how a certain case comes out? Well, well we won't talk about that case because it is, in fact, on our, our, on our very next calendar. You captured a, a lot of people's imagination earlier this term when you issued a dissenting opinion at five in the morning. And I'm wondering what your, your <clears throat> I've always heard that Justice Ginsburg uh, worked into the wee hours of the morning. I'm wondering what your usual workday is these days. Well, that, that, was, <clears throat> that was an execution. And this, the, <clears throat> the states that have the death penalty tend to set the execution for the wee hours in the morning. For, forgive me, I was talking about the voting rights, the oh. Texas case. The... Oh. oh, yes. yes. Well, as you know, I feel very strongly on, on that issue. Have you seen the movie Selma? I have not seen it. Well, you should. It tells how important the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was. And then in the Shelby County case, this court declared the key part of the Voting Rights Act unconstitutional, an act that had overwhelming support from both sides of the aisle in Congress. And this court struck down that, that key portion. I thought that that was a most erroneous judgment, and I said so in my, in my dissenting opinion. So will we see any more 5 a.m. opinions from you this term? <laughs> that was a, a request for a stay, so you, there's a very short time uh, to do that. I think the most pressured time for this court was Bush v. Gore, when the court accepted the case on a Saturday, received briefs on a Sunday, heard argument on a Monday, and on Tuesday, the opinions, multiple opinions, were released. I think most of us were sorely sleep-deprived at the end of that episode. But ordinarily, as you know, we have a sitting that runs two weeks and then two weeks without a sitting when we are both writing opinions from the sitting just past and gearing up for the sitting that will soon begin. One more question about the court as a whole. Um, I know you care about the court and you talk about the court not being seen as an extension of the political branches. Um, but on this court, oftentimes, you have a breakdown, including in the, the Shelby County case that you talked about, uh, where the court divides between the Republican appointed members and the Democratic appointed members. Um, is that dynamic? Uh, reason for concern about how this court is perceived by the public? This court gets no easy cases in the, in the sense that all right-thinking people would agree on the judgment. We tend to take cases only when other judges have disagreed on what the federal law is, whether a statute or constitutional provision. And even so, and, and I know the focus is often on five to four s splits. But we are unanimous, at least in the bottom line judgment, in about 40% of the cases. I think that's a pretty good record. And if people would look at some of the unusual lineups in the cases that don't make the big headlines, you, you will see that this is... Um, this, this court does not operate like, like the, Congress, the Congress does. You know probably about an opera that will have its world premiere on July 11th in Castleton, Virginia. The opera is called Scalia Ginsburg. And it's about two people who have different views on in constitutional interpretation and we have arias expressing our views. But the last duet is we are different, we are one. That is, different in the way we interpret the Constitution, 
one in our reverence for the institution we serve. And both of us are deeply committed to this court and its, its place in our democracy. Well, Justice Ginsburg, thank you so much for your time. We uh, very much appreciated uh, having a chance to talk with you. It was a pleasure.